did Einstein, I don't know that I've seen the paper that did this, did he predict gravitational waves? Yeah, so Einstein, when he was d developing the theory of general relativity, and this was the theory of gravity. So the, the thing that, so we all learn in school, Newton's version of gravity. And Newton's law has been, it's easy to understand, it's intuitive, it says you have two objects that have mass, and they're going to feel a force of attraction between them. And it was quite quantitative. He said the force of attraction will be proportional to their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance separating them. It's very clean. It's, That's a clean, it's clean operation. You know, we teach it in, in very early uh, sort of first encounters with physics. And it was quite successful. It told us about how orbits uh, would work. Uh, and and it, it also had pretty early on places where it didn't work perfectly. Now, what Einstein when he was formulating, thinking about gravity, he kind of turned it on its head. And he said, well, look, gravity's not really a force. Gravity is the geometry of space-time. Big words. But he had a series of papers, two or three, uh, from 1915 to 1918, in which he sort of formulated this theory of, of general relativity. He wrote down what, what are now known as Einstein's equations, they look not that much worse than, say, Newton's law, except they're quite beastly. They're very difficult to solve. But part of that work was that he did ask the question, what happens if whatever object you're thinking of isn't just sitting still in space. What happens if it's moving? And not just moving in a const at constant velocity. What happens if it's accelerating? And then out of his equations popped this wave-like object, which he called gravitational waves. Ah. And, and the other you know, thing I want stuff like that to pop out of my equations. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have equations where stuff pops out? Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. Look, me neither. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm still stuck on the wave part. Like, the wave part, gra okay. Is, is gravitational surfing? <laughs> they have a lot of analogies to that, because if you wanted to try and visualize what would this look like, one way that you could is you could think of space-time as the surface of a still pond. And you drop a big rock in the middle, and there's a wave that travels, a ripple that travels on the surface. It travels outwards from where you drop the rock. And if you were a little teeny tiny ant on a surfboard, you would surf that wave, right? And the so, wavelength, so the distance between the crests, right. would be related to how big was the rock, the rock that you exactly, dropped in. Exactly, right. Okay. So yeah. when you measure gravitational waves with LIGO or whatever mm -hmm. other tools available to you, you try to measure the wavelength of that so that you can infer what created that wave. Because you don't otherwise, you didn't see the thing happen. No, exactly right. So we measure a number of things. We measure the wavelength, which is the spacing between between the peaks, uh, in the successive peaks. We also measure the amplitude, which is how big, what was the height of the wave. Mm -hmm. And those both of those things are changing with time, depending on what the, the source is. So by measuring sort of the shape of the wave, as you go into it and as you come out of it. As, as it passes by you. Yeah, as it as washes you, over the earth. Exactly. And as you do that, you can tell many, you can infer some of the properties of the system that emitted that wave. Sort of like if you just saw the ripple at the edge of the pond and you, you have to kind of measure the, the frequency of the wave, you have to measure the amplitude of the wave, you have to know something about the density or the viscosity of the water that of the pond. Well, that's and right, because the that, medium, it would come through differently. Right, and, and once you have put those things together, without ever seeing the rock fall in the center of the pond, you can say something about the rock, and that's kind of what we're trying to so do. So that's very impressive, because you, can, you get this measurement and then out in the research papers, these are two black holes of 30 times the mass of the sun colliding a billion mm -hmm. light years away. I mean, that's right. badass to make that kind of statement. It is. I think that the properties of the black holes are almost, I can't think of too many things that are more badass than that. I, 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 I agree. I, I, I have to tell you why. I mean, so, you know, one, one of the, the first gravitational waves that we measured with LIGO were from these 30 solar mass black holes. And you know what these monsters were doing? At the time that they collided, they were moving at half the speed of light. Whoa. Okay. I mean, just... <laughs> you are speechless. I, I'm trying to picture it. I don't know if I, if I, you, I can actually picture what that... 
I'm picturing a Godzilla movie. Where <laughs> it's like a black hole with like little arms Start and legs. Start with Godzilla. Okay. And they're both fighting each other. <laughs> but instead of the city, it's space. That's where my brain is going. And instead of, you know, moving at sort of human or, and you know, Godzilla speeds, they are moving at the speed of light. You know, the amount of energy it takes to accelerate a little electron in our sort of, you know, experiments to the speed of light. And to think we do it with something that's 30 times the mass of our sun. So th there's no greater particle accelerator than the universe itself. Indeed. Ooh. 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 Is, it, is, there a, is it making a sound when it happens? No. And the reason is that but Did wait you, a minute, you guys put a soundtrack to that wave. Uh, that's Metallica? different than whether it made the well, sound. Well, then get, then get us out of that little, that media ploy, because I always have to undo things that the media does or give context for it. Because yeah. people say, well, I, if space is, is a vacuum, and because they knew that sound doesn't right, come space, space. no one can hear you scream. No, exactly. <laughs> that's a legit call, right, for the movie, the Alien, Alien. Yep. So did you endorse this attachment of sound to it? How did you, as an educator and as a physicist, where were you on that? Yeah, so, you know, I, I think of it as there are many, many phenomena as scientists or as humans and observers that we can't directly observe. Let's take light. So we love to look at pictures of even astronomical objects where they're emitting x-rays. We can't see x-rays, so... We color it blue, mm -hmm. and we can see blue, and then the object looks blue, and we imagine that's an x-ray. And so when I think about sound or the sound of these you know, waves, it's an encoding. It's a way of, of mapping it onto senses that we do have. Okay. Right? Okay. So that's how, you know, because otherwise... That's fair enough. You know, so I mean, I th think about the way that we visualize a cell. We can't just look at, at a blob of stuff and say, that, you know, there's the cell. We've used microscopes, we've used ways of observing, and then we put together we've, picture. We've enhanced our feeble senses. Exactly. To gain access to the exactly. universe that would otherwise lay forever invisible in plain sight. But it's dangerous because if you pick the wrong sound, then nobody cares. <laughs> like if you make a video of two black holes colliding and it goes boing, <laughs> boing. <laughs> you gotta pick the right sound. <laughs>